G'day, Chris here and welcome back to Clickspring. I've mentioned previously how gear cutters can often be one of the most expensive parts of a new project, and that's certainly the case for clock and watchmaking. Cutter cost can also get in the way of trying out new ideas. It's hard enough to justify the purchase of new cutters for a one-off project, let alone for a prototype or test that may ultimately go nowhere. Now of course, there are some good home shop solutions to the problem, each with their own pros and cons, but the information on each tends to be scattered across the sources. And if you're just starting out in the home shop, then sorting through all of this and deciding on the best way forward is probably even more daunting than dealing with the cost of the cutters. So that's what this next five part TGT episode is all about. I'm going to cover a well-tested gear cutter forming process that's easy to follow and execute and will give you exactly what you need in a gear cutter. Low cost, high quality results and the freedom to choose between both the involute and cycloidal profiles as your projects require. Now the method is essentially a blend of the button tool methods presented by these four authors with a few small modifications and additions to streamline it. Most notably this calculator which will be covered in detail in the following videos. It allows you to specify all of the normal gear parameters and then it generates the data necessary to position the button cutters to form the profiles. Now as much as I love making new tools, I figured on this project we'd probably like to get to the finish line sooner rather than later. So I've tried to keep the new tools to a minimum and where we can't avoid it, I've made sure that they serve more than one role. Having said that, these are fun parts to make and it's an excellent first time lathe and mill project. So, given what it'll provide to you over the long term, I do think it's well worth the effort. One of these tools addresses a key challenge of using carbon steel cutters, and that is keeping them sharp as the job proceeds. It's based around what I'm calling the cutter carrier, a chunk of aluminium or steel if you prefer, that holds and indexes the cutter, and ensures that it travels smoothly along a guide shaft at a particular orientation to the sharpening stone. Now if you've ever used small bore commercial cutters to cut steel pinions, then you'll know that they're more than a little notorious for being easy to damage. And that's because, despite being made from high speed steel, the job that we ask them to do is tremendously demanding for the size of the cutter. So they really do need to be handled with great care. Low RPM, coolant if you've got it, and if possible, it's worth sparing them from as much of the cutting as possible by roughing out the part with a different, hopefully much more durable cutter, like maybe a slitting saw. Well, everything that applies to those high speed steel cutters applies even more so to the carbon steel variety. We'll be making our cutters from O1 tool steel and after heat treating, they'll be plenty hard and tough enough to do what we need them to do, but they do have to be treated gently. A key point is that they can deteriorate rapidly once the wear begins to set in and so they benefit hugely from regular honing of the cutting faces as often as the job will permit. And that's where this little tool comes in. Aside from providing the initial sharpen of the cutter faces, it makes it dead easy to give the cutters a quick tidy up in the middle of a job, as you'll see in a later video. Now you might be wondering how much gear theory knowledge is required to use these tools and get a good outcome. Certainly a grounding in the basics is a good thing to have, and there are many terrific videos and books that I'll link to below to get you sorted if you need it. In fact, gear theory really is the ultimate engineering rabbit hole. There's almost no end to it, and the more you dig, the more you'll find. You can get into it as much as you feel you want to, and it can only help you get even more comfortable with the process. But it's not essential for what we're doing here. In fact, the main point of developing the calculator was to take the headache out of the process, and to keep it as practical as possible. If all you want to do is make functioning cutters consistent with the common standards, then you can do just that. We'll definitely cover some of the areas that relate specifically to the reasons behind a few of the things that we're doing. For example, I think it's worth covering the areas where we choose to compromise and how that compares to the compromises of the commercial cutters. But again, it's all practical to explain why we're doing things in a certain way. Now you may have noticed that I've scaled the design of all of these tools to suit my specific wheel cutting setup. I mostly use the small horological cutters that have a diameter of around 25mm and a bore of 7mm. Now that bore size sets the diameter of this guide shaft and much of the rest of the design follows from that. So as is, the tools will serve you for the smaller end of the module range. But if the work you have in mind is larger, then be assured that the process is flexible. 
and intended to be scalable to whatever you need it to be, within the usual limitations of milling style gear cutters. Some care does need to be taken to align aspects of the tool with key features of the cutters, and I'll point those out as we go along. But the basic ideas, like for example milling the shaft halfway as a reference plane, remain exactly the same. Ok, so this shaft travels freely on the carrier ball, and now requires a plate to fit onto that flat, to locate the movable parts of the tool in relation to the top surface of the grinding stone. Now this plate doesn't need to be anything fancy, since it's going to become scuffed by the stone over time anyway. So my choice was to use a piece of scrap aluminium plate, and to shape it using a combination of the scroll saw, mill and belt sander. Ok, time for the fasteners. And they could be something as simple as a pair of cap screws, that'd do the job nicely. But these parts will be regularly disassembled as part of their normal use, so there's something to be said for making a set of fasteners that are a little more convenient. Now a small brass component like this is easily bruised, and we really do need it to seat down hard on the face of this collet for the next bit of turning, which of course would guarantee that it gets marked. The easy solution is a small paper washer. And finally, a bit of that threaded rod finishes off the parts list. So let's put it all together, starting with the fasteners.
Okay, so now that it's all assembled, there are some aspects of the design that are worth noting. Firstly, you can see how the guide shaft keeps the cutter in a straight line as it's being sharpened. It also stops the cutter from rolling laterally, which is one of the main problems associated with freehand sharpening of a cutting tool. Secondly, when it's placed upon the sharpening stone, the locating plate forms a plane of reference that passes through the central axis of the cutter. The cutters for which the tool is designed are four tooth zero rake cutters and they're mounted onto the shaft so that a single tooth projects from the carrier body end. They're a close fit in the carrier slot but they can rotate freely on the guide shaft. A pin passes through a hole in the side of the carrier that also matches carefully placed holes in the cutters. This pin serves to lock the orientation of the cutters relative to the carrier and it also permits easy indexing from one tooth to the next. The result is a very reliable and repeatable platform to present the cutter to the sharpening stone. In fact, in a lot of respects, this tool achieves through its geometry what we generally try to do when freehand sharpening anyway, and so it removes the need to be quite so vigilant about rolling edges. But most importantly, it ensures that the cutter face advances axially towards the stone, ensuring a consistent profile can be maintained across each cutting face as the cutter is sharpened. Now you'll notice that I'm being very careful to not say that the cutter profile is therefore maintained as the cutter is sharpened. As it happens, there's quite a bit going on here that rather complicates that statement. Suffice to say, some sort of profile compromise is a fact of life for all gear cutters, even the commercial ones. And as we'll see in the next video, it generally tends to be a balance between the pursuit of the ideal profile and practical convenience. Now I mentioned that this is a multi-use tool. It also happens to be a jig for forming the cutter buttons and a platform for sharpening those buttons. And in each case, it has some simple features built in to help make that job easier. That'll get you making your own cutters sooner rather than later. All of which we'll cover in the next video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.